<laughs> all the buzzed feed news that is fit to editorialize for April the 17th. It is Easter Sunday, and we are recording this ahead of time, so it's not actually Easter Sunday. Um, the first story that I'm going to cover, which is relatively old news by now, but I want to talk about it anyways, it comes to us from the Whiskey Wash. Bardstown Bourbon Company has been acquired by Pritzker Private Capital. Um, Pritzker, Pritzker Private Capital is an investment firm, and they recently acquired Bardstown Bourbon Company, um, and they have a history of purchasing things uh, and making them better, more efficient, a whole host of other things. The president and CEO of Bardstown Bourbon Company has indicated that current management is going to continue to lead the business, and so it looks like Pritzker is going to have a very um, loose reins on this particular venture. Um, the the Bardstown Bourbon Company, which if you watched my last episode, I absolutely uh, adore them. I like what they're doing. And news like this always gives me a little bit of pause, a little bit of concern about what might happen with this particular brand. It's been around for a little while, I believe, since about 2014. So we're looking at you know a handful of years of high degree of success. Um, their capacity has is, is grown immensely during that, that time. And they are making tons of whiskey every single year. Um, and so anytime there's an acquisition, you start getting concerned. Uh, is something going to happen to this distillery? Are bean counters going to be in charge of making decisions as opposed to distillers and blenders and the teams that they have um, on hand? The folks at uh, Pritzker Private Capital have indicated that this partnership is an excellent fit with whatever that they're doing as far as innovate. Uh, investing in innovative food and beverage producers, um, state-of-art production uh, capabilities, a whole host of other things. The chairman and CEO of Pritzker, and PPC, we're just going to start calling it PPC because that is a tough name to get through. I don't know if it's... Just... This damn robot vacuum is getting serious down here. Let's let it go back the other direction now. Tony Pritzker, the chairman and CEO of PPC, said that this particular team is focused on trying to connect their family's investment money with family-owned companies. And so they're looking for privately-owned companies to be able to um, acquire and then generate income from. <clears throat> Comments from Tony have indicated that this particular relationship may have existed for a number of years as Bardstown has grown, Bardstown Bourbon Company has grown not only its portfolio, but the people that it partners with and distills for. But for me, the discussion is not so much about the purchase as it is about who did the purchasing. Um, Pritzker's own pretty much everything. Uh, maybe the discussion of the purchase for me isn't as much about the acquisition as it is about who did the acquiring. The Pritzker's own a whole lot of different things. Um, and you may have heard of a governor by the last name of Pritzker. Um, they've been around as far as wealth and wealth acquisition for a very, very, very long time. One of the things that you know can can give you some degree of concern is um, we can all distinctly remember last summer whenever Heaven Hill had uh, a problem with negotiations with their local union and unions, whether you are pro or or anti. Um, have had a huge impact within the bourbon industry as far as how things are made. And um, we were at the, the Kentucky Bourbon Festival last year, and the, the, the workers of Heaven Hill were on strike. They were present. They were, they were pleasant. They had you know, meaningful discussions, and they were just looking for a way to band together and make sure that their family's needs were taken care of on a regular basis. The Pritzkers, however, are known to have engaged in anti-union practices for a very long time. Now, whether uh, Barstown Bourbon Company is looking at um, or is a part of unionization or any of those things kind of remains to be seen, but um, anti-union practices can often be seen as actions that are taken by individuals to ensure the profitability of the company, but not necessarily whether or not the employees are being taken care of appropriately. Now, that may have almost no impact on Barstown Bourbon Company specifically, but it's a thing to kind of keep your eye on is, you know, there, there's a high degree of business acumen that lives within this family. It's a, you know, 20, 30 billion dollar empire um, includes things like Hyatt, um, Marmon, which is an industrial conglomerate, um, TransUnion Credit, uh, 
a host of other things. They've been they've had a really good reputation for accumulating wealth, um, but they've also made news for tax evasion, offshore accounts, a whole host of other things. The kinds of things that you expect, uh, and maybe that's the problem, is that the kinds of things that you expect from wealthy individuals trying to avoid maximizing the amount of money they have while minimizing the amount of money they have to pay. So anti-union, tax evasion, there's concerns here. There's things that you, you know, we as, as consumers want to pay attention to if we want to be um, good citizens and make sure that there's a, a longevity of a brand and not so much as a, a profitability concern. If you want to take the time, you can dig around and understand a little bit more about who the Pritzker specifically are. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm shifting any of my um, purchasing habits because, you know, like they said, the, the Barstown Bourbon Company um, is being managed by the exact same team it was being managed before, but it's absolutely going to warrant a significantly larger um, magnifying glass for anything that happens at the financial management level of this particular brand. Are they going to start sacrificing um, some of their standards, some of their ethos of being for uh, profitability? And, you know, profitability is not the enemy here, obviously, but if the beginning and inception of your brand is to create an experience and an environment and to not lower your standards to make more dollars, uh, and then you make that immediate shift, you can expect that there's some degree of, of, of um, backlash or reaction that's going to exist from that. Another big story that's been floating around for a while now, um, it's been floating around somewhere since December, is coming from Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery in Tennessee. Um, there's been a myriad of reactions of what's going to happen, and I think a lot of it has more to do with some of the confusing communications that have come out of this brand. It's another brand that I'm a huge fan of. They do a lot of finishing. They do a lot of uh, purchasing of MGP distillate. And from what I understand, I believe they also have a relationship with Bardstown Bourbon Company where they're laying down some distillate there as well. But the Nelson brothers have done two things here uh, very recently. One, is with, one of which is indicating that their nationwide presence as far as what they sell for bourbon is going to shift to a more namesake brand for their individual names as far as the Nelson's Brothers Classic Bourbon and Reserve Bourbon. Um, so they're going to put the Nelson family name on it, and that's going to be the national offering that exists. Now, the thing that gets a little bit more confusing is... The initial email that I got, you know, there, there's you can sign up for notifications, news notifications on their websites, and I do that for a host of brands that I really um, am interested in. But the initial indication is that the Bell Mead line, which is their sourced bourbon, was going to become distillery only. If I remember correctly, the email we got said this is going to be a distillery only offering going forward, um, which with some of the, the cask strength the stuff, they had indicated that for some time that that was the intent behind it. But the standard shelf offerings were going to do that. And then there was a wave of news directly after that that came out, whether it was substantiated or unsubstantiated, that indicated that the um, Nelson Brothers were going to eliminate the Bell Mead line altogether, which created a ton of questions uh, of fans. Uh, because, you know, okay, so the Bell Mead line for Bell Mead Bourbon is gone. Does that mean that the finishing series is gone as well? The, you know, the highly sought after honey cask finish and some of the tequila and Spanish brandy and the Mouvedra, and they've done a ton of different finishes under the Bell Mead line. Did those disappear or do they shift to the to the Nelson's Brothers line that they're creating? And you know, the I guess the 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 understanding here, or at least my my perception is, is that likely the age and quantity of barrels that they were able to acquire for MGP for a very long time um, is changing makeup wise. And so carrying forward the Bell Mead line and expecting it to be a similar product is gonna be increasingly difficult. And so the final bit of news that has kind of come out about this is that now it's going to be just a Tennessee-only option for the Bell Mead line. They'll continue to purchase and um, be able to blend together MGP offerings um, to make the Bell Mead line, but the Nelson Brothers line will be the nationwide offering. Um, one might guess, and this is all hypothetical or my hypothesis, whatever you want to call it, is that the Nelson Brothers line might taste slightly younger, slightly less aged, slightly um, less expensive uh, flavor-wise than the Bell Mead has historically because it is tougher and tougher to get that stuff. It might also be a place where they're going to start shifting 
whether they're uh, incorporating some of Bardstown Bourbon Company's distillate or some other source of distillate. Um, most communications have indicated that they're going to continue with the Indiana bourbon that goes into their barrels and gets aged. But how much of it and what is that flavor profile going to be? I don't see any reason to be significantly concerned here other than the possibility of Bell Mead going away because it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic offering that they have. But, you know, if they can't continue to maintain it at the flavor profile that it currently has, this is a smart thing to do. This is exactly what they should do because um, you don't want to, you know, start to tarnish the image of what has been largely a high quality product for a very long time. The next bit of news that we want to talk about is, is going to be two parts here. So the first is that a, a couple weeks, a month ago, Barton had indicated that they are launching four new Thomas S. Moore finished bourbons. Thomas S. Moore is the, um, historically, or at least the first round of the, the, the wine finishes were, the finished bourbons were all wine. Um, there was Cabernet, there was Chardonnay, and I can't remember what the third one is off the top of my head. Um, probably sherry, something along that lines. But they had put out a slightly more aged um, version of what might be considered 1792 that has been finished in these casks. Um, but now they're moving and they're extending the series. They're they're extending it into other flavors. They're going to bring in cognac, Madeira, uh, sherry, and Merlot. And those of the four, only one of them is slightly... Um, New, you know, Merlot might be the one that is because Cognac Madeira and um, Sherry have been in a host of other brands for a while. But this addition of Merlot might be an interesting, um, interesting addition for their product offering. Um, at the same time, in the last couple of weeks, uh, Barton has indicated that they are going to stop doing distillery tours at the 1792 distillery in Bardstown. And it was one of We'll call it, it was one of the more unique tours that exist because of the industrial nature of what it was. There wasn't a huge focus on um, bourbon tourism like many of the other distilleries have. And that could have been, you know, for a lot of people, that is a refreshing change of pace. For others, it is um, not nearly as interesting. They want the entire experience. Um, I, I kind of lean towards the, the former is that this is different. This is more like what it actually is in a distillery from day to day. But they're going to focus on making sure that their brand and what they are producing is um, at the forefront of their priorities. It also could be an indication that that Sazerac uh, is, you know, the parent company Sazerac, which owns a ton of things. You know, they're going to have their hands in what's happening in Frankfurt uh, with the Buffalo Trace Distillery and the E.H. Taylors and all of those of the world. Maybe that becomes the premier um tourism experience for all of their brands and they shift that there and and they just maintain the, the 1792 location as a production facility who knows and it'll be interesting to see what happens in the coming months uh, the next bit of news history in the making there's there's an article over on go bourbon it's a little dated now uh, because castle and key you know the title of it is castle and key will soon release their first ever bourbon they released that a couple of weeks ago and then they released their second batch of their bourbon as well both of them went super fast they were gone at the distillery you know within seconds um this is probably one of the most anticipated bourbon releases, uh, at least in my opinion, since Peerless released its uh, first bourbon. Um, they have not, they, they followed a similar path where they did not source any bourbon from anyone to release. Um, they waited for their distillate to mature and to end up in the bottle. And then there's, you know, this big question also that adds a degree of anticipation to it of, is this anything that Marianne Eves made whenever she did her tenure there as a master distiller? I don't know that I have a clear answer on it, but their offering uh, was gobbled up about as fast as I expected it to go. Um, I did not get an opportunity to be over at the distillery for the release day. Nor was I there able to be able to there for the batch two release day. But luckily, my local store was able to to snag up batch one. So we'll give that a taste later on and kind of see what came out of that. If you don't know what Castle and Key is, it is what might be considered uh, bourbon archaeology, where they are reviving a distillery site a bit at a time while producing some spirits for all of us to consume and doing some really unique things uh, on their on their site. It's probably 
the first or second most unique experience that exists on the bourbon trail right now. Um, and you know, it's only going to grow over time. So it's a fantastic experience. They've got some pretty nice rye out there. There's a lot of people that really enjoy what they're doing with gins. I'm not a big gin drinker, so I can't, I can't give any commentary towards that, but their, their bourbon, uh, we'll see what's happening with it. You know, I've, I've, I've seen mixed reviews, but I generally try to avoid letting those tarnish my own individual viewpoint on what is happening with that particular uh, distillate. So that's it for today. That's all the news that I want to talk about. That's all the news that I want to cover, and that's all the news that you're going to hear about. Uh, if you watched this and you enjoyed it, please leave a comment. If you didn't enjoy it, leave a comment as well. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Do something with it here on YouTube, so that way I can understand if you like it and we are friends, and if you don't like it, well, I don't care. 